looking at cabinet, uh, and I think that the depleted numbers here this evening identify that the uh, COVID virus is still out there, and I think there's every reason for us to be very, very cautious and take care. Um, before starting the meeting, I, I would just like to take this opportunity to express the sincere condolences to family, friends and colleagues of our colleague, Jonathan, Councillor Jonathan Johnson, who very sadly and suddenly passed away last weekend. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone that I found Jonathan very friendly, amiable, and perhaps described as a gentleman, who I'm sure will be sadly missed by all those that knew him. So, if I could just remind um, councillors and officers to put their mobile phone on the, or electronic device on silent, if they have one near them, and those present in the room should face forward, speaking directly into the microphones and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphone. Please would <coughs> remote participants mute microphones when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the council joining us remotely should leave cameras on. Officers leave cameras on only for the agenda you're speaking on. After each item has been presented, I will invite members to present, present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak and they would, should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of cabinet present in the room will be making the decisions. I will confirm the result verbally <clears throat> for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Please be aware that there can be a time delay of around five seconds whilst a remote participant appears on, appears on screen. So if we can uh, move into tonight's meeting and if I could have authority please to um, confirm that the meetings are a correct record of the proceedings. You all agree? So move. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, are there any apologies for absence? Councillor Tempe. Okay, but I believe she's joined us remotely. No, perhaps she hasn't. No, thank you. Are there any additional agenda items, Malcolm? There are none, Chair. Are there any urgent decisions? No, there are no urgent decisions, Chair. Okay. Um, disclosure of interest. Members, please speak clearly if you have a personal or personal and prejudicial and say the agenda item referred to. Yes, Councillor Barnes. That uh, I believe it to be personal. No other declarations. Um, members with a personal and prejudicial interest will be asked to temporarily leave the meeting uh, as at that item. Uh, members will be invited to rejoin the meeting when finished. So if we move into the reports, please. Um, better mute my phone, I suppose. Okay. So agenda item six, the draft anti-poverty strategy report of Joe Powell, head of housing and community, and supported by uh, spokesperson, Councillor Sam Coleman. Um, this report to consider the recommendation arising from overview and scrutiny committee held on the 14th of March, that the draft anti-poverty strategy be approved for the consultation purposes. Uh, Joe, are you going to um, lead us on, please? Thank you, Chairman, um, and hello, everyone. The, um, Report before you, um, you'll remember in June 21, uh, a recommendation was made to Cabinet that an anti-poverty strategy be formed um, for Council approval um, and uh, that we worked with statutory and voluntary sector partners uh, to, to produce and uh, operate such a strategy. Um, the scale and scope of the challenges faced are clearly too much for one organisation to uh, take on single-handedly, so we need to be working with, together with our partners to coordinate a strategic commissioning and operational level to, to deliver um, a, a response to the, the, the many forms of poverty that exist throughout the district, um, which include income poverty, but include broader 
in the case of poverty, poverty such as health, housing, food poverty and, and others beyond. So in November, a multi-agency group uh, event was held at the Pelham in, in Sydney. Um, and we had a number, a range of voluntary sector and statutory partners at that group to, to begin to form an, um, an action plan and, and strategic oversight for, for the strategy itself. Um, these actions have been captured, captured in Appendix A. Um, and the group also identified um, that the strategy needed to be delivered by a group which we are forming as the strategy steering group which will essentially be a, a, a mix, a blend of, of the services that are fed into the strategy to date. Um, and it's important that the aims and objectives of that group re, uh, remain achievable. Um, progress reports on the strategy and the actions at Appendix A will be taken through the local strategic partnership, which will govern and oversee strategic um, progress uh, and support us with uh, feeding information and, and a dialogue up to the East Sussex uh, strategic partnership to which the LSP can feed information. Um, the consultation plan is Appendix B. Just to give you a quick overview of the plan, um, it sets out the groups we intend to consult and, and the methods we intend to use. Um, and the majority of the consultation will take a, an online questionnaire format. Um, so it's clear that the strategy development um, and, and the causes, excuse me, of poverty are multiple and complex and the symptoms wide ranging. And, and the effects of poverty are felt by a range of different uh, sections of our community, each needing uh, tailored responses to, the, to their specific needs. So the strategy proposed is therefore being developed between the key partners. And, and, and it's fair to say at this stage, this, this is a starting point strategy. And a lot of these conversations are burgeoning and, and, and happening um, as we speak. And, and the, one of the main aims of the the strategy is to coordinate ourselves better at that strategic level, more effectively at that strategic level, so that more detailed and comprehensive strategic aims and objectives can come forward to, to Cabinet and Council again in future. So I have to take questions on the report. I'm ready? Right. Thank you, uh, Joe. Are there any questions um, from any members? Right, Councillor Sue Projan. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Joe Powell, for leading and helping on this one. And congratulations to Councillor Coleman also for your leadership on it, because it's a really, really timely, good piece of work. And my goodness, it's needed more than ever at the moment. Um, someone once described, someone recently described the less well off as facing a tsunami. And it certainly feels like that at the moment and I was I don't know about other members but personally I was quite shocked at the Chancellor's recent statement absolutely no mention at all no mention of universal credit or benefits or any help for people who are the least well off in our society and the 5p off petrol well I think Germany's put 25p off, pe off petrol um, and there's lots and lots of questions. Um, the the £150, I'm not sure, Joe, if you're the person to answer this, but the £150 that they can get, they've got to be have it on direct debit, be on direct debit to get it directly, um, people on, on, on universal credit. So what about those who are not? That's one of my questions. The other thing I wanted to, to bring up, and I'm sure other members are absolutely aware of this in the report because the evidence gathering showed one of the big issues is where do people get information from and if you can tackle that two things that need tackling this where do people get information because there's a plethora of organizations out there who knows where to go how do you find it i mean people will say to you well the county council have got eskis or whatever they call it now have you ever been on it it's like Search for Robertsbridge Community Friends and you get 11 pages of, of, of um, um, organisations within a radius of Robertsbridge. It doesn't tell you. It's not there, the, the Community Friends group. So I think ESCIS is too complicated, it's too bulky, and, you know, the ordinary man on the Clapham omnibus will not be able to, to use it. So if you can tackle that, the other thing to tackle 
which was interesting on our recent service level agreement, um, sorry, the strategic partnership. The strategic partners, we had two GPs on the last meeting, and they were saying, we don't know who the poor are. How do we get in touch with them? Well, as a community group, we don't know where the poor are, and this data protection wall is stopping a huge amount of good work. And so I, if that can be tackled as well, the, for me, those are the two things that, my goodness, if you can tackle those two things, we'll have done a really good job, this council. So thank you again for your excellent work. Oh, I did want to pay tribute to RVA as well, because RVA played a key role in this as well, I know. Yeah, just to underline, I neglected to mention that the RVA were at a review and scrutiny. The, the, the CEO, Claire Cordell, came to introduce the report with me. So, um, yes, they're very much this has been developed in partnership with them and will be delivered in partnership with them. And in short, that's who one should be going to for, for information and support and advice on services locally. It's rather voluntary action. It's, it's, the website is very informative and also you can just pick up a phone and, and contact them. Citizens' advice as well, and ourselves as council. You know, there are unfortunately a, a lot of uh, services doing doing similar things um, and and doing things that aren't particularly well publicised. So, inf information and promotion is one of our key, one of the three key objectives of the strategy to improve that because um, it's recognised that it's a it's a there's a deficit amongst citizens, but also amongst professionals in terms of what's out there and how, how things can be coordinated more effectively. But these are big structural challenges, and, and it's, it's for the, really for the local strategic partnership, in my view, to, to really get a grip of those. And, and poverty and, and responses to poverty is just one issue amongst a range of other issues that the community need to access more effectively and that we need to deliver more effectively at a local level. And that's really the function of the LSP. So it's very key to me that this feeds into that LSP so that the whole, the complementary piece in terms of regeneration, in terms of um, promoting employment and businesses um, is also um, brought into this whole conversation because those two things are symbiotic and, and without, you can't get out of poverty without growth and regeneration and, and, and the rest. So it, it's really a big, big piece, this. And one of the key functions of a council, really, but um, this is hopefully one small part can help us tackle and alleviate some of the symptoms more effectively together. I hope it's a bit of a broad response, but I hope it covers some of it. Okay, thank you, Joe, for those um, uh, response to that question, those questions. Um, other members would like to uh, counsel with Baylis. Yes, thank you. Um, and I would like to um, echo uh, what um, Councillor uh, Prochak has um, mentioned about the budget and the recent um, announcement of support uh, for people. We have to remember that um, there's a big percentage of universal credit claimants that are actually in work. And, what, um, you know, this, this is not people who are out of work that, um, that, that are the sole um, recipients of universal credit. There's a big slice of people that are in work. And... One of the um, key indicators of, uh, around poverty for, for Rother District Council is, is the wage levels. We are the lowest in East Sussex in terms of wage levels for businesses or for jobs that are based within Rother. I mean, yes, we have got some wealthy pockets of Rother, but people tend to work outside of the area. They're jobs based in London. Um, or Tunbridge Wells or, or, or places like that. The actual uh, wage rates for people who uh, have got jobs based in Rother is, is the lowest in the county, the weekly wage. And I think um, uh, our officer Ben Hook would be able to um, actually um, confirm that um, as being, you know, a key, I think, a key indicator um, around, uh, around people's income. So um, I think this is a, a really a great piece of work. It's brought together the evidence. It's, it's got a strategy um, which, which is clear and articulate. I mean, obviously, when we go out to consultation, it's really, really important that the wording and how it's presented to people is, is looked at very carefully so it's accessible um, to, um, to everybody. 
Um, so, or, or you know, um, we have to sort of make sure that it's, we, we drop the um, robber speak or the officer speak and 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 um, and, and make sure that the um, you know that the the actual strategy document is is accessible. That would be the only thing I would say. But excellent piece of work. Really proud of Councillor Coleman um, and um, his work on this. And thank you to Joe and to, to the RVA for for supporting it. Thank you. And I I propose the that we accept the recommendation. Yeah. That's fine, we'll move on to that. If I can invite uh, Councillor Paul Osborne, um, because it was come out of the overview and scrutiny, and the excellent work that was done by the task and finish group, I thought that was just, and when you read this document, it's an excellent start for what we want to be um, achieving in Rother going forward. It's not an overnight situation, but this is a very workable uh, document to, to work with. Um, so perhaps, Paul, you, I could just invite you to um, make some comment, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, as has been said, this, um, as you'll see in Appendix C, we, um, we set the work, working group up in um, January 2020, so it's almost been raining longer than COVID. <laughs> so, uh, um, obviously, um, there, there was sort of aggravation uh, with, with lockdowns and everything else on, on progressing it, but, um, but we've got to a good position now. Uh, and the work of uh, Councillor Coleman in ensuring um, that everything ticked over uh, and kept going is commendable. So, so we find ourselves with a document ready to, to go out to consultation. Um, at probably a very opportune moment, given the uh, cost of living crisis and everything else that, that is, is supposedly around the door, around the corner. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we're very happy with the outcome. Um, yeah, when we always sort of say when we set up a working group, um, we let them do the work, um, and when it comes to committee, it's easy. There's no need to pick it to bits because that's what we've we've asked the, the group to do. So they, they come up with a good report, uh, and and that's fine. So so excellent from from our point of view. Um, you'll see there that that we um, also said that future comments from members should be fed through Councillor Coleman as a spokesman on on the poverty. Um, and young people, also as the chairman of the group. So, um, and then he has um, confirmed that he will be keeping an eye on it to make sure it doesn't go stagnant somewhere. And um, no, it's um, it's really good. So we're happy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, and I think that's uh, those, those words of um, of excellence for the work that uh, Councillor Sam Coleman put into this, because he actually attacked this with real, real passion because I think that's important, and I think it's great when a work group goes away and completes the work and bring, brings it back to the, the scrutiny committee to, um, to take it forward. So um, thank you very much for that, Sam. Would you like to make some comments now, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think um, the, the 10 years of austerity, whether you think that was a good thing or not, um, Brexit, whatever impact you think that may have had on people um, or otherwise, then a pandemic, um, and now a cost of living crisis and what well, the Daily Telegraph calls the biggest fall in living standards on record. Uh, if, if you're someone either in poverty, uh, close to poverty, uh, in a low paid job, um, trying to support a, a large family, uh, looking after a, a disabled family member, <laughs> you've been hit blow after blow after blow. And whether steadily or quite quickly, you're, you're Standard of living has fallen since sort of 2010. And every time you think that curve is changing, something new pops up. Um, and uh, certainly in my, in my view, the government seems to have closed their eyes and put a peg on their nose and are just ignoring the problem and not dealing with it. And so we as a local authority have to say, well, actually, if the government aren't going to deal with this anytime soon and aren't going to tackle these issues pro properly, which is what's needed, I think, to properly uh, combat poverty in a, in a larger scale, then we need to do something. And that was really the, the genesis of, of this strategy through overview and scrutiny, through looking at, well, we don't necessarily have services that directly tackle poverty, so to speak. Um, obviously, we deal with housing and homelessness. Um, we are the sort of the, the face, if you like, of people claiming benefits and such. 
um, but we don't have a, a direct channel there. But what can we do with our services? And more importantly, working with partners um, to better help those in poverty and to make sure that we're doing everything we can be doing uh, as a district, as an authority, um, to help people who are struggling. And I think um, testament to, to Joe and his team for all of the work they've put in uh, to the task and finish group um, for, um, you know, sitting during the beginning of lockdown on a Zoom meeting for quite a few hours listening to sort of testimony from various organisations, uh, from various officers, really trying to understand uh, the root of these issues. And, of course, RVA, um, Claire Cordell, uh, for hopping on board with us and really taking a leading role from the voluntary side of, of pushing this and making sure that it, it, it carried on going throughout the pandemic, throughout staffing changes and everything like that. So I, I think this is a really commendable piece of work. Um, obviously, I'm you know, humbled by the comments about my part in that, um, but it was very much a team effort. And I hope that once this goes to consultation, those who take part will see what a good strategy it is uh, and their comments will reflect that. And hopefully even some improvements might be uh, suggested and I hope we'll take them on board if they are. Uh, and then finally, we can get this into the council's uh, sort of books uh, and, and start to work at clawing back into a decent standard of living for, for the thousands of people across our district. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sam. And, and, you know, a very satisfying piece of work, which I think everyone would acknowledge. Um, I've got a couple of remote um, members who want to speak, but before the, Lorna has got a, um, a hot off the press a response to a question, so. Thank you, Chair. So, Councillor Prochat, you asked about the £150 payment for those on band A to D and what would happen um, if they're not signed up to direct debit. Obviously, we're encouraging people to sign up to direct debit if they haven't already, um, but we will be writing to every um, person who hasn't, who is eligible but hasn't signed up to direct debit with a unique code, asking them to go online and provide their bank details and so payments can be made directly. Um, we'll also look at what can be done for those that don't have access to the internet. So we are thinking about that. Thank you for that. Bigger partner, I invite Jonathan and then Terry. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, it's already been said that this is a really good report and a really good piece of work. So thank you both to Councillor Coleman, uh, who's been working away at this very uh, diligently and to the officers for just bringing the whole thing together. I only have one comment, I hope it's a constructive comment, uh, page 18 on, on the Appendix A, talking about access in rural areas. As Councillor Prochak said, it's really difficult. I mean, you know, I'm a chair of the Parish Council and we always are trying to identify vulnerable people of, of all kinds and it is, even when you live and you, you nearly know everyone, the ones that need the the, um, the help are often the ones you can't find. They 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 don't make themselves obvious, and I don't think that virtual hubs will be effective at, at all because one those people often don't have access, and even if you provide some form of access locally where they can actually sit and use that is you know privately to discuss what is a very 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 sensitive issue is a problem. Um, I, I, perhaps the housing associations can help us. You know, you hear doctors can't help, and they're ones who will be seeing everybody at some time and getting a feeling. So I would just, uh, I would just ask the those involved to really relook really at that and try and test some things out to see, uh, you know, how you how we might be able to access those people. I mean, it may be as simple as a, a leaflet drop to everyone to say this, uh, you know, this is available and this is how you access it. Um, that's my only comment, but, uh, you know, really well done and a, and a nice start. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just, um, just one second. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Councillor Prochon. I just wanted to come back on that and thank um, Councillor Vinehall for raising it. And I know, Joe, and uh, you're very aware of this. Years and years ago, we were very proud of a policy that we had, which was called Help and Advice Centres. And we actually had very effective Help and Advice Centres in Rye, and in Battle and in Bexhill. Now, those have been diminished over the years to, to, to make savings. But I think the hub idea, something the county council are working on, um, getting hubs, and I think 
it's especially in the rural area, you need a physical place where people can go. And there's been some good work done at Rye Food Bank, where actually we have got offices there uh, when people come into the food bank. So any, any model like that will help the rural areas. And, and certainly we know from experience with youngsters, um, say in, in Northiam it was, I think, who couldn't get, get do their homework because they didn't have access to the computers, etc. So to have a, a virtual service in the rural areas needs to be looked at quite carefully. Thank you, Sue. Joe, did you want to make, I know we, you have made all observations on this previously. Yeah, no, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to be presented as the solution. Um, it's part of a bigger solution, I think. But in terms of what we can do locally in the budgets we, and resources we have available, um, we are very keen to support the community sector to achieve things like what's been achieved with the Pelham um, and from the gr ground up. And I think those tend to be more effective and they tend to, they tend to appear where they're needed. And there's a danger of being too top down sometimes, I think, in terms of where we, one thinks a hub ought to be. And, and what do we mean by rural areas? You know, I agree 100% in terms of the market towns of Brian Battle that we need to do more to make them into hubs themselves, effectively. But it's very different from, I don't know, Iden or other rural locations where there's, there's, there's really off, very remote. And how do we get pe people, um, services there, who are particularly younger people, who, who may very well be, you know, um, adept technology and um, what, not want to take, you know, the one bus that comes by one afternoon a week to, 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 to one of the market towns. So it's about, it's about, you know, horses for courses, essentially, trying to find the right solution and a blended solution. Yeah, thank you for that um, explanation. If I can invite uh, remotely Councillor Terry Byrne, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, two points. One, uh, Councillor Coleman, uh, Explain the situation facing the those on lower incomes uh, very very well, and it is abs an absolute tsunami. And also, as he said, there's no magic bullet. But as a district council, we've got to tackle those areas that are under our control and and essentially chip away at these awful situations. Now, this I don't think uh, is in one portfolio, and I, I hope all my colleagues, my cabinet colleagues, will examine everything that's in their portfolio and see if there's anything they can do uh, that assists with this strategy. Uh, and my second point, and leading on really, um, we all know of councils up and down the country. If, if, you, if you went in and said, give me all the strategies that have been sitting on the shelves for 10 years, you have a massive pile. This one, however, has this wonderful list of actual actions, things we're going to do. And if, if the cabinet, the councillors, and the voluntary sectors can all get together and actually work on those actions. I think we're in with a chance of making things, well, ameliorating this sort of tsunami of poverty that's going to hit us. And hopefully those people living in Rother might be a little better off and a little more looked after than in some of the other areas. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Terry. I think we're at a point where um, that we need this um, report moved. Um, Resolve the cabinet be requested to approve the draft anti poverty strategy for consultation with key stakeholders and the wider population of Rother. I think, Christine, you've moved this. I need to second. And uh, Councillor Projet will second. And if those here can vote, which unanimous. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, for, uh, Joe, Sam, Paul, um, and the scrutiny team that made up the, um, um, the task group. We can move on to item seven. Which is on page 29, those that have got paper reports. So this is um, a report of uh, Anthony Baden, Chief Finance Officer, to consider the recommendations arising from overview and scrutiny committee meeting held on the 14th of March regarding the council's finances as at the 31st of December. Um, Tony, if I can invite you to lead the report, please. Okay, thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, this is a quarter three monitoring report. Um, members just asked to note the report. It's been to overview and scrutiny committee on the 14th of March. Um, there is also a recommendation there to approve um, two SLAs uh, for rather Citizens Advice Bureau and Bexhill Museum, and they're outlined in paragraphs 22 and 23. 
So uh, the headline figure, so the, the revenue forecast uh, at the moment, we're predicting that will be £128,000 uh, lower than the approved budget, which is uh, clearly a good thing, and that's an improvement of about 220000 from the report uh, previously uh, reported to Cabinet in quarter two. Um, forecast capital outturn is 15.3 million, which is well below the, uh, the revised budget of about 62.6 million. Um, but as I've explained on several occasions, I think before, that doesn't necessarily mean an underspend, it just means that the slippage will, will roll forward into, um, into the next financial year. And I will say a little bit about council tax and uh, business rates, collection rates in a minute as well. So, uh, on the actual uh, uh, meat of the report itself, um, Chair, Appendix A details all the figures that uh, hopefully members have had a chance to read. Um, the main changes from quarter two are explained in paragraphs four to 15. Uh, I'll just pick out a couple of highlights for uh, the benefit committee now. Uh, so, uh, the strategy and planning overspend has decreased by about £54,000. Uh, mainly due to a reduction in the cost of using capital business services to clear the planning applications backlog. Um, we've also received further funding from central government of about £270,000. Um, and this has helped us to, uh, the, these are these extra bits of money that have been allocated have been, uh, to help us, for, the, for example, for the costs of um, managing the Omicron grant distribution process. Um, so it's good that, uh, that central government have, re have recognised that and obviously good for our, uh, for our resources, our bank account. Um, Jeff, it's not in the report, but um, Councillor Vine Hall, and I hope I'm not seeing his thunder by saying this, but Councillor Vine Hall did ask me about um, uh, some of the items in the, uh, in the, uh, in the forecast. Uh, and just to say that uh, the, the report is for quarter three, uh, after, which was the end of December. So trying to get this report as current as I can. I've used the um, end of January figures, uh, so that's as up to date as I can get it, but the report still had to be completed by, uh, by early February. So there have been, and there will naturally be, some changes to the forecast before we get to the end of the financial year, and one of those changes will be the Burbosh Judicial Review cost, which no longer uh, will materialise. We had a forecast of £50,000 overspend in the, in, the, uh, in the budget for that. Uh, but that will now drop out, so uh, that's uh, also good news for, uh, for the Cabinet, I'm sure. Uh, capital Programme Appendix B refers, as I say, the forecast of 15.3 million is considerably lower than, uh, than the approved budget. Um, the main changes uh, relate to uh, a purchase of the Mount View Street site, uh, and this is the NHS have a purchase option on, that, uh, on part of that site, and the receipt from the sale uh, will offset the purchase costs, so there's no actual overall impact on the council's programme or borrowing for that matter. Um, the, outlo uh, the impact on reserves is outlined in Appendix C and hopefully that's, uh, that's self-explanatory to members, uh, so I won't say any more about that. Um, just a little bit about collection fund performance. Uh, I, I always put, a, put in something in the report about um, collection fund performance because whilst uh, the money that we get from council tax and business rates income is actually set in the financial year, uh, any changes washed through in, in future fun, uh, financial years. So it is always a good idea, I think, to keep an eye on those uh, collection rates. And I think the encouraging thing there is that uh, both council tax and uh, business rates collections, uh, they're both slightly higher than they were at this, this point last year. Uh, as I say, that was before um, certain global issues and things have, 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 uh, have kicked in. So we're, we're by no means out of the worst of it, but I think that was a, an encouraging sign we consider that we had um, lockdown in March 2020 and the impact that we thought that might have had on collection rates. Uh, and I think in particular business rates collection rates recovered extremely well from quarter two uh, when the comparative figure was about 6.3% lower than it was in the previous year. Uh, and I think we felt at the time, and I think I may have explained this to the committee, I think we felt at the time that uh, a lot of the um, businesses that had to pay business rates may have been a bit slow off the mark in doing so because the uh, re business rates relief scheme uh, came to an end uh, in, in July, uh, sorry, in June 2021. So it may be that they were playing a little bit of catch up there. But that rates recovered well, which is, uh, which is also encouraging. Uh, so I think that's the highlights uh, of the report, Chair, and I'm happy to try and take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for the narrative around the report. Are there any members that would like to um, ask a question? I've got Jonathan waiting um, remotely, but if there are any members here that wanted to make any... Um, Christine, Councillor Bayless. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. I just wondered if um, um, somebody could explain the Bexhill Promenade Shelter One. I, I mean, I understand that's an additional expense on that. I just wondered if if could explain what that is. Apologies, John. Just going to the relevant part. Page thirty-five. Appendix B. Yes, sorry. So, what was the question? What was the uh, what's the additional expenditure for? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't got that level of detail. It's about five thousand pounds. Am I looking at the right line? Yeah. No. Somewhat can can an officer answer that? Um. We had £60,000 put aside in the capital programme um, from Section 106, still funding to do the Bexhill Promenade Shelter, and I'm not aware there's any additional spending on that at the present time. Okay, thank you for that explanation, uh, Deborah. Um, any other point, Christine, to make on that? Chairman, I'll just add in a comment. What the, I think the... Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you with uh, more detail, Councillor Bayliss, uh, after the meeting. Um, but what, the, what we're looking at is the in-year programme. So you don't get prior year spending, you don't get future year spending as well. And I think that, where we, that may well be where the confusion is. Um, so I'm happy to clarify that uh, after the meeting. Uh, Councillor John Barnes. Not a question, Chairman. I just wanted to make uh, two or three comments in the light of our discussion at Cleverview and Scrutiny. Um, I was grateful, actually, that Tony in his introduction didn't use the terms surplus and deficit. I wonder if we could reflect on our use of those terms, because it seems to me they don't really convey uh, the right feeling about this report. Uh, positions either have improved or got worse since we estimated. Uh, to confuse that with surplus and deficit, I think is to use the wrong language. And it makes it quite difficult to read in places. Um, my second comment was really, and I have declared an interest, um, you will need to correct some of the things uh, in appendix uh, dealing with Alliance Homes because it can no longer be called that. Um, I don't know what stage we're going to do that. I didn't fully understand the year-end position as it showed up on, but that, since I am an interested party, I'll pursue that with Tony outside the meeting. I had two points of substance, both of which were really made at overview and scrutiny. One was a distinct worry that uh, we had what was called a, a, a deficit, in fact, but what we haven't managed to do yet is identify all the savings we were going to make during this year. It's not that we haven't made savings, but we seem somehow to cancel those out. So at the end of the year, we're not going to be as, make as many savings as we promised. We were worried about that at overview and scrutiny, and uh, I'm grateful to see the financial stability report is coming tonight. But again, there are no figures in it. And it's a bit worrying because we don't really know where we are. The other point which came up of overview and scrutiny on which a number of us felt quite strongly uh, was on Bexhill Museum. It's not that I will be at all averse to the town council contributing to its costs, uh, but I think to transfer it as may be contemplated to the town council uh, would be a mistake. This is a museum of more than Bexhill interest. Um, and that was a feeling that a number of us had at overview and scrutiny, that this really remains a museum of a rather wide interest and should remain very much as part of our portfolio and not part of uh, a local council portfolio. I only instance, for example, uh, the very important finds uh, from the Bronze Age uh, fields on the Link Road, but I could point to a number of other areas of that museum uh, that really make it actually of, in some cases, almost national uh, significance. And so, and I was not alone in expressing those doubts. I thought 
uh, they ought to be expressed here tonight uh, so that you can take that forward into the negotiations I know you're going to have with the Town Council. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you for those comments, and I'm sure they will be noted, and uh, I think that the, um, the uh, negotiations and the discussions with the uh, Bexhill um, Town Council and any other town and parishes will be underway, um, so there's not a lot we can say about it at this moment, but we will be moving towards that. Um, if I can invite um, Councillor Dixon. Just, just to respond to Councillor Barnes, if I may, about the £8,500 that Rother currently gives as a, special, a surface level agreement. This is basically, as I try to explain that at scrutiny, this is basically a top up of, for their running costs. It used to be a higher amount um, because Bexhill Museum has been so successful in the last round of service level agreements, we were able to reduce that to only 8,500. And that 8,500 is currently raised through Bexhill special expenses, so only residents of Bexhill pay it. What we're asking for, we will be asking for in future, is for that top up funding to transfer over to Bexhill Town Council along with the special expenses, um, and really with no effect on rather other than our ability then to raise more council tax because we have less special expenses. I, the, um, I'm sure uh, one of the officers can give much more detail on the other support we already give the museum and which would continue, including the rental of the building, which I believe we own. I'm getting a nod over in the corner, which is good. So we do contribute a lot more than just this eight and a half thousand, this is just a top up which we would be hopefully getting Bexhill Town Council to transfer over to their um, precept and away from our special expenses with absolutely no change to anyone paying the bills. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you were nodding, Deborah. Did you want to add any comment to your nod? I can do, Chair. Thank you. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, we support the, the, the curatorial services. Is that how you say it? <laughs> um, with um, Julian Porter, um, we, we pay his salary, so that's a huge support there. And with the building and maintenance agreements that we have. And we also support with uh, the Rye Battle and the Winchelsea Museums too. So in, in terms of covering the whole of the district, there are other museums out there doing an excellent job with um, a small amount of funding from, from the district council. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you for those additional points. If I can invite um, Councillor Paul Osborne, um, as this came through scrutiny uh, earlier this month. Paul? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't think there's much else I can add, to be honest. Um, Councillor Barnes said just about exactly what I was going to say. I thought I'd better mention Councillor Barnes and the museum and his concerns, because otherwise I'll get told off, but he beat me to it. So, uh, <laughs> so, so no, and, and, and Tony, Tony mentioned the collection rate was up, so that was good. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there's, there's, there's nothing much I can add, to be honest, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, no other members at present want to say, uh, make any comments. I invite uh, Jonathan Vinehall remotely. Jonathan. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think the points about the, the, the museum are interesting, and it, it just gave me thought to, that the, we should perhaps be encouraging these organisations and other similar ones who have relied on us for these grants, which do add up. Uh, to uh, perhaps consider the lottery and gaining their support or, or you know, taking a little pressure off their finances that way as well, and ours at the same time. That was just uh, some, a comment for thought. Uh, my, my actual main comment was really, firstly, to thank Tony for the summary of um, the breakdown of the de deficit on strategy and planning. And uh, no, he didn't steal my thunder. I was very pleased that he raised the issue of the Burwash JR, which rather than cost us 50000 I think we're receiving um, uh, the, you know, costs of about 29000 something like that. I'm not sure how that all pans out, but it's a far better situation than expected. Um, about half the costs uh, are the, 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 the costs for capita and clearing, the, you know, helping to clear the, the backlog of planning applications. And, and I'm going to make the point that this is a very, very good example because, uh, you know, the, the problem with the backlog was in existence, you know, when this administration came on, it was it was already raising its head and it related to uh, us not retaining staff and actually having lost staff as well and not being able to recruit. Uh, we are now starting to see some improvement in recruitment of, of staff, but it is a very good example of when you cut staff or you don't have a a, a department which is running well and 
uh, and retaining staff, you end up with a problem, and that problem ends up costing you more than you probably saved. And that's exactly what's happening here. So it's cost us you know, 324000 We are making good progress. I will make the point that I've had the discussion with, with both uh, Malcolm and Ben last week in terms of how we are going forward with with that, uh, you know, may, ensuring that the the backlog is is continuing to clear. You know, we still have a bit of a backlog, and we don't want to lose the momentum that the officers have really worked hard to achieve. So uh, I'm not sure how those numbers are going to work out. You know, for the you know, going into the the end of this year, perhaps the beginning of the new year. But it is a it is a little like the waste contract when we had Kia and it didn't work. This is pre me. Uh, and the cost of actually getting that right was was uh, an unexpected cost, but now we have a good service. So there is a cost to a good service, and I think uh, cuts were made that perhaps shouldn't have been made, or staff not retained that perhaps we should have retained or worked harder to retain. So I think um, that does account for quite a lot. About 40% of this overspend here is it comes from one um, site, the Spindlewood Drive Appeal, and it's a, it's a sad result, really. Um, it's a good example of a site that was really marginal in terms of, of uh, allocation. And uh, uh, it is unfortunate that, once again, this was an inherited application which had been bounced around the council uh, a little from some time before the administration. And uh, uh, it's unfortunate that this cost has uh, come towards us. So I just thought I'd make those points, but I really thank Tony for giving me that breakdown earlier. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your comments on that. Ben, was there any comment that you wanted to make with regards to um, the points that Jonathan raised? Uh, we, yeah, no, we're continuing to look at the options, particularly regarding the, um, uh, the continuation of the planning contract. Uh, we need to do some additional work on how much that will cost uh, versus what benefit will be gained out of it. But we are looking at that very seriously now. Uh, possible potential three-month extension. Thank you for that clarification. Kevin, would you like to uh, move the report and make any further comment, please? Thank you, Chairman. Very happy to move the report and to note the better position um, this time round than, than last time. Um, just to update members um, who aren't on the property investment panel, the property investment panel has met recently. And while obviously I can't go into details of um, what was discussed, I can, can confirm that a deal, another deal is, is hopefully progressing and we should be receiving some very good news on that front and indeed making a, a, a good difference into our income. So uh, watch this space um, in, a, in a few weeks' time, hopefully. But apart from that, happy to, um, happy to move the report. Happy to second. Thank you very much. And uh, if we can um, uh, vote, those in favour? Thank you very much indeed. Um, item 8, continuation of the Tony Baden um, <coughs> serialisation. No progress of the financial stability programme and updated timetable and approve the merger of the two work streams uh, and approach to be adopted. Um, you can report on this, Tony, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll start off on a <coughs> slightly negative note. And Councillor Barnes has pointed to a typo that I didn't pick up uh, at all. And that paragraph seven should refer to paragraph. There's a wording in there that's, that refers to paragraph five, but of course it should be referring to paragraph six. So thank you for that, Councillor Barnes. And very well spotted too, if you might say so. <coughs> you're, you're waiting for someone to spot that, were you? <coughs> well, I had money on someone else, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't put their hand up, Chair. But. Um, uh, yes, so the report asks, uh, as you just said, Chair, it's, uh, it's to note progress and, and, the, and the merger of the, uh, the two strategies, the Financial Stability Programme and the um, Protecting Discretionary Services Strategies, uh, and also uh, approve the approach to evolving services as outlined in, um, uh, I'm going to get the paragraph number up, paragraph six. So, um, since the last update, uh, officers have continued to work with members to, to identify options and focus on uh, what are called big ticket, big ticket items that are going to deliver uh, significant cost savings, such as uh, public conveniences, uh, car parking, and uh, car parks and grounds maintenance. 
Um, costs shown in paragraph four, I should point out, are very illustrative. That's what we, uh, yeah, that's an estimate of what we think the costs are, are going to cost next year, or, or what the services are rather going to be next year. So they're not necessarily at this point in time indicative of uh, potential savings that we can achieve. Um, so with regards to merging the, uh, the financial stability programme and the protecting discretionary services strategies, uh, Cabinet adopted the, uh, the protecting discretionary services strategy back in June last year, and I'm sure Cabinet will remember that. Uh, and this was broadly to transfer community assets uh, to other organisations with a review to supporting the delivery of, uh, of discretionary services. Uh, and uh, we discussed this with members, and we felt that the two strategies had very you know, several common goals, and it made sense to combine the two rather than uh, have them uh, running as separate entities, if you like. So the proposal is to, to merge them into a single strategy, which would operate under the auspices of the Corporate Programme Board. And CBA, uh, the Corporate Programme Board membership will then thus be expanded to include Councillor Proshak, who is the current lead for the uh, Protecting Discretionary Services Strategy. Uh, so with regards to service development, um, the options are, I won't repeat them word for word, I'm sure members have read them, they're, they're laid out in paragraph six. Uh, I should say that consultation has begun already with uh, Bexhill Town Council, which is a positive step forward, uh, and the intention will be to expand this to uh, all town and parish councils across the district. Uh, I'd just like to finish off by saying a little bit about resources and the, uh, the timetable, if I may, Chair. Uh, so we, had a, we, we originally created an income generation manager post. We were unsuccessful in, in, uh, in recruiting to that post. Um, the, the post is to be funded from the investment, uh, uh, the investor save pot of money of three quarters of a million pounds, which uh, Cabinet approved as well. Uh, so we decided to redesignate that post as uh, to be, make it more like a project management post, and that will uh, will hopefully um, give the the FSP uh, 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 more, uh, maintain its focus and and give it more impetus to to achieve the objectives that we we know that we need to achieve. Uh, and recruitment for that post is currently ongoing. So hopefully there'll be a positive outcome to report from that soon as well. Um, and a revised timetable and project plan, that's currently being devised, and that will reflect the, uh, uh, the, uh, the approach laid out in the report above, and hopefully that will um, give us uh, uh, more targets to aim at and achieve over the next few months and when we come to do the next update for Cabinet. And I'll, uh, that's it, Chair. I've got nothing else to add, and if anybody has any questions, I'll try to field them. Uh, thank you, Tony. Are there any questions from <coughs> members? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm wondering if Tony could just maybe expand a bit on, on number nine, because I, I'm not 100% sure what he means by that and, and, and how this secondment is going to work. Page 41. Ah, right. Yeah. Page 41. Okay, yeah, I think um, because of the sort of, yeah, there's, there's, there's several diverse, there'll be several diverse range of projects there, and we will need to um, second resources from across the council to, uh, to uh, enable those projects to land, if you like. Um, if I'm honest, I don't think it's that. It's not quite that easy as to, to explain how that's going to happen. I think it's uh, it is a challenge to make all of this happen within existing officers' time. Um, we know that, and that's why we've uh, appointed, or why we're trying to appoint uh, a project manager to ensure that we can actually coordinate all those activities at the same time and get them to happen. So, I think it's quite a difficult question to answer. Um, my colleagues may have a view on that, um, but as I say, a lot of this work will be ha will have to be done by officers within their own, you know, within their existing time. But, but, sorry, Chairman, if I can come back. When you talk about resources, you are meaning human resources and not financial resources. So was that a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, perhaps Malcolm or Lorna might just want to add some clarity around that. Chairman, I, I, the intention was that the intention is that I mean this is an important plank of moving forward in, in how we operate, and it's felt that we need to give it, a, in effect, almost a dedicated project manager to the approach who will actually ensure that we're you know, keeping to the timetable, that we're moving forward in that way. Um, 
the, the length of time this will take, I don't know. I mean, we don't have a huge amount of time to deal with this in, but I think if we want to achieve it, and we must achieve it, then it does require that resource and that focus. So that, 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 that to me, is what, what, what paragraph nine is basically saying. Thank you for that. Ben, did you want to add something? I was, oh, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was just going to say that we, um, we, we undertook a recruitment for this post last week. The kind of candidate is now accepted as of this afternoon, so I've not had a chance to update uh, our other colleagues. Um, so we'll be looking to get... That's an internal candidate as well, which means we should be able to get them onboarded relatively quickly um, uh, and, and start them onto the, that project work. I won't sort of divulge their name until we've gone through the processes of getting their contract signed and so on, and you know, maybe they've given the chance to let their line manager know, but... Yeah, that's, that's now being confirmed. <laughs> and so we hope to hopefully have them in, on board within the next five weeks to start those projects. Oh, that sounds encouraging. Uh, Sue, that's your project. Thank you. That's just good news. Um, I think the one thing I wanted to say about this is that when we took over the administration, we realised, with advice from the Treasurer, we realised what was happening with this council in terms of, of, of using reserves. And we had a plan, and that's the big thing that's been different. We've got a plan. Now, we had a plan very early on. However, the whole thing about uh, devolving services, if you like, it's, it was, it's been a council policy for years and years and years and hardly moved at all. Um, so then we've had the COVID situation and lack of resources, as mentioned in paragraph 9, there's, and the operational role of the council and community services is, is hugely demanding, especially during COVID. And so we knew that we needed to have a person to drive it. And not only do we need um, a project leader on it, to focus on it, to get it done, because we need to get it done, otherwise it wouldn't happen. But we also need uh, advice from legal, we need community people on there. So we need to do it well. We need to do it in partnership with our town and parish councils, and we need to do it so that people do not lose out on whatever they want, whether they want the toilets or the lamb gate or whatever we're talking about, um, that we need to do it to the satisfaction of our communities. And that's our aim. And it will be great to have somebody focusing on this totally so we can move along. Agreed. Uh, any other member would like to uh, make a comment? Councillor Cortell. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome um, our pursuit of protecting discretionary services. I think that's extremely important. And um, uh, within that, could I ask what progress the negotiations with Bexhill Town Council have made? Um, concerning the potential devolution of discretionary services. Uh, perhaps I can invite um, Lorna to our, answer that question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been working very closely with the town clerk um, because really what we need to come up with is a project plan now on how this is all going to happen. So we've, um, I can't go through what services and assets will be um, devolved, but what I can say is we now have a timetable and what's become very clear is by sort of May time, we really do need to have an, an, an idea of what, of what is going to be devolved. So that's really not very far away. And we need an agreement, at least in principle, um, of what will be going over. We are looking at it in terms of two phases. So the first phase runs from April 22 with a view to handover in April 23. And then we start a year later from April 23 with a view to handover in April 24. So we're trying to make this a manageable task because, as, as Councillor Prochak said, um, these things do take time and time isn't on our side. So that is one of the key mar milestones. By May, we, we will have an idea of, of the package of, of services that will be devolved. Um, and that is to fit in with the budget setting process. So by the summer... The town council need, needs to be working on, on its budget in the same way that we do um, in, in light of having a budget by o October, a draft budget. So we are kind of confined by those, those um, the budget setting timetable. 
Um, but we are now talking about what will go in each of those phases. And by, as I say, May, um, there will be some kind of ag agreement in principle of, of what will be going forward, which I think is really good news and we're working very productively. Thank you, Lorna. Trust that answer your question. Thank you. Good. Uh, Councillor John Barnes. Yes, a couple of questions have just occurred to me as a result of what the Deputy Chief Executive said. Uh, we're running towards an election uh, next year in which there will also be a town council election. We're talking about a phase programme that's going, uh, if I heard rightly, at least two phases. Um, are we looking at the possibility we may have to retain part of special expenses next year? Because after all, the services we're talking about in Bexhill are very largely, not entirely financed uh, by special expenses. I think the remainder of the rather does subsidise Bexhill to some extent. Uh, but fundamentally, if these services are not taken over, we will need to actually fund them in some way if they are to be retrieved. Is that a question Tony or Lorna would like to touch on? Perhaps I'll invite Kevin to make those. Um... Okay, well, um, what we're talking about in these three options here, public conveniences are charged rather wide, so there's no special expenses for Bexhill. Car um, Subsidised car parks are charged rather wide, so there's no, um, no Bexhill special expenses. Grounds maintenance is the one that has the major, main part of special expenses, so that will be the key one as to whether we keep, have to keep special expenses or not. The other thing involved in that, of course, is that the, um, our contract is due to expire as well at the same time. So there's going to be a number of factors involved with, with the grounds maintenance. From earlier discussions, I know that um, that wasn't high on the town council's list. It is high on our list, though. So that is a, a, a disparity at the moment that we've got to come over. But certainly grounds and maintenance. The other bits and pieces of special expenses are minor bus shelters and things, which will be, I hope, quite easy to, to transfer over. But it's the, the one item on special expenses, which is the biggie, is grounds and maintenance. Uh, does that cover off, John, the uh, point you made? Yeah. Good. Okay, um, there are two... Sorry, Christine. Yeah, Councillor Bayless. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Chair. Can I just um, re remind everybody um, that the Bexhill Town Council completed a survey called the Big Survey last year, and there was a specific question around special expenses. So um, in the report of the thing, it says we asked... Um, uh, people whether rather district council charges Bexel on C special expenses in their council tax um, and then list them. Residents have suggested that we could improve these services if the funding was transferred to the town council. Do, do you agree? 90.78% of respondents and that was 1,974 people responded to that survey agreed with that statement. So there is definitely um, a swell of opinion behind um, the, the, you know, the town council uh, taking on the special expenses. And so we need to build on that and um, facilitate that, I think. Yeah, thank you for making that point, because I think this was something which um, um, the, the delays in actually discussing um, the various things going forward was as a result of them wanting to give their consultation Back. And there's an awful lot of work that was done in, on, on their consultation, and there was a lot of manual work there. So it really wasn't until sort of January when all of a sudden they felt they had a mandate for various um, areas to go forward on. So uh, thank you for making that point. Um, there are two um, members remotely, and I think that's um, Councillor Tony Ganley and Councillor Jonathan Vinehall. Are you there, Tony? Yes, I am. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with regard to projected savings, uh, how much has been saved so far and uh, how much is forecast to be saved, let's say, over the next 12 months? Somebody um, respond to that question? Um, I'll try to, but I, I 
the question's a bit vague, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, the, the whole point of the, F, of the financial stability programme is to identify savings. We haven't brought those um, forward uh, to members yet. We've discussed them with members or with the uh, financial stability programme board, as you know. Um, so, sorry, that's a bit of a flaky answer. I can't really en en enlarge any more than that. And I'm sorry, I didn't get the, the second part of the question. What was forecast in the next 12 years? That's 12, 12 months, months, sorry. <laughs> Take a 12 years. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sorry, if you just bear with me a second, Chair, I can find that out. I think it's about uh, 1.6 million, something like that. So, for financial year 22 23, uh, this, the savings target is about 635,000, and for the following financial year 23 24, we're looking at ratcheting that up to about 2.1 million. So does that answer the question for Councillor Gamley? We can't hear you, Tony. Right, that's because my microphone was turned off. I'm being very obedient in turning it off immediately. Um, 635,000 in the coming year, and one point how much in the coming year? So for I may chair for twenty three twenty four. It's about two point one million. So I think I originally said one point six million, which is okay. okay. So it's two point one. Right. Million. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I think it's a very important discussion. And I was just a little concerned about some of the uh, uh, some of the comments made earlier. I'm going to sort of start by saying that when we in, when we started, we inherited a a, a long-term or medium-term financial plan, which basically said all of our reserves were going to be used up if savings weren't made. And I say this because at the full council, uh, I think it was Councillor Maynard or Councillor Kirby Green, I can't remember which one, apologies to the one that I've got wrong, um, said, you know, we handed you so much reserves, now they're down so much, uh, which is correct, because that's what was projected. And unfortunately, um, year one was getting some plans together, which were immediately stopped by COVID because nothing could happen, to actually make some, some substantial savings uh, required the formation of the Bexhill Town Council because uh, you needed a body to actually take over those, uh, you know, those, those assets, and that couldn't be done. So that was step one in that process. Um, the whole... The whole um, devolution of toilets and car parks uh, is, a, is a project that was going from about 2014 or 15, but nothing really moved forward in any substantive way for about five years. I think um, Councillor Dixon has really focused hard on this and, and now with, uh, with Lorna at hand is focusing on actually achieving these results. But because that council wasn't formed, and because it took time for that council to, to move forward, it's very difficult to actually make those savings in this current period, and therefore those reduction reserves were going to happen, uh, and I think it's important to understand that. What, I'm, what I am concerned about is that there has to be an absolute focus by every senior officer on this, because this goes to the heart of our finances. And without money, we aren't going to be even able to deliver the statutory services as we should, let alone the discretionary services. So I just want to, I just feel it's important to have that message out there that this is something which has to be everyone's focus from the top, top down officers and cabinet as well. And, and up for, for that matter, every member, because this is very much about the survival of the authority yeah. Thank you very much for making those um, comments, Jonathan. Um, so I think people have got to really understand the seriousness of the situation going forward, and it's got to be working together in order to achieve that. Kevin, did you want to make any further comment on this report? Thank you, Chairman, and, and not for the first time. Councillor Vinehall steals my thunder, because exactly what I was going to say. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear comments from officers today. Sorry. That they that they understand the seriousness, that we've had dates mentioned, we've had um, deadlines mentioned, and that is very important because 
as has been said, there's nothing more important within the council at this time is to get this work done. Um, I think we can all safely say it has stalled for an, a, a variety of reasons. Um, it can stall no longer. And Cabinet is very clear on its priorities, which are written down in paragraph six. Um, and the three major areas of work that we have to do, and that's not, as I said earlier, there are things like allotments and bus shelters and other things that, that need to follow, but these are the three, the three things that cost us the most money. Um, public conveniences has been talked about in, in great detail. We've had a, a little bit of a bonus where we're not having to pay business rates on, on public conveniences. That has saved us £50,000, but public conveniences across rather the 32 toilets cost us half a million pounds a year. Um, we need to be able to do that better, cheaper, and, and more efficiently. Um, and I know that officers are looking at the way that we may be able to use SIL funds to refurbish um, in, as, a, as a good uh, method of um, moving those on to towns and parishes. Um, we're looking at charging, um, particularly at Camber Sands, uh, where we need to make some more money out of our tourists. And then um, point four is the extreme option that if it can be proved that something isn't required, then we can, we can stop doing it. Uh, Subsidised car parks, again, that's car parks that we offer free, to, free um, parking in, do actually cost quite a lot of money, £91,000 a year, which is something that we really can't afford. And is also not, not uh, fair across the district where other, other places we do charge. And grounds maintenance, as we've already discussed, is, is the big one. Um, and that one needs to be dealt with and, and devolved wherever possible uh, to Bexel and Ryan. I didn't, I didn't know we had anything in battle, but I stand corrected if we do. Um, and if and the, our fallback option there is to go down to a minimum specification if we had to, because um, we need to save the money. So in that, Chairman, I'm, I'm happy to um, move the report and um, with the caveat that the recommendation... Uh, number three be changed that's laid out in paragraph six. Second. If we can look to vote, it's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, Tony, for producing that report. And if we can go forward to the next item, which is item nine which is the uh, Arbor Cultural Services contract. Um, this is a statutory requirement that we have to provide, I believe, Deborah. Um, if I can ask you to present that report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. The current Arbori Culture contract expires in November 2022, and this report seeks to procure and appoint an Arbori Culture Services contractor for a minimum of three years. By working with Hastings Borough Council to jointly procure a separate contract, we aim to achieve best value contract terms. And paragraphs two and three of the report set out the contractual approach and the council's responsibility for tree works and management across the district. By its very nature, the requirement for specialist tree work can be unpredictable, as we can see in the recent um, storm um, that Storm Eunice demonstrates. Um, as with the current contract, we will seek a similar flexible approach whereby the council requests specialist tree works to be completed um, by the contractor as and when required at a contractually agreed rate. This contract is therefore, in effect, a call of contract. This arrangement has worked well to date, that's for the last 10 years, and is felt to be most advantageous to the council as the council is not beholden to using the appointed contractor and can seek the services of other contractors if required and felt to be financially beneficial. Paragraph 7 of the report sets out options that have been considered by officers along with the associated risks and the reasons why officers are recommending the option proposed in paragraph 7i and that is that we jointly um, with Hastings Borough Council um, procure a similar call of contract to commence in November 2022. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for um, uh, the narrative around that, Deborah. Are there any questions on this contract or this report? Um, Christine? 
Yes, I'm very happy to um, propose the recommendation. I, I mean, I would go back um, to, to Storm uh, Eunice and, um, and obviously that put a real strain on our con current contractors. Um, are the current contractors, um, have they decided not to, or they will continue to bid or will bid um, for future work? Thank you. Um, we did approach the current contractor to extend the contract. Um, again, it, it is within the current contract to be able to extend it, but they um, turned us down um, because the current contract stipulates um, a CPI increase that they felt did not cover their costs. Being a 10-year contract, obviously over the term of the contract, costs have changed enormously. That doesn't mean to say they won't bid for a new contract, but it will be a considerably higher price, no doubt. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks for clarification, um, Deborah. Um, we've got someone to move this uh, report, Christine. Second, if we can vote on this. That's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Deborah. If we move on to the last, last item, I believe, yeah? which is uh, agenda item 10. A report of Ben Hook Place and Climate Change um, to amend the Council's Community Infrastructure Levy Governance Agreement and Funding Decision Protocol. Um, so, Ben, you're going to lead this, and I think that Jonathan is looking to make some observations on the report. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Um, so, bringing forward this paper to uh, review the uh, recently approved Community Infrastructure Levy Governance Arrangement and Funding Decision Protocol. Um, it was highlighted after the, uh, after the approval that there was uh, maybe a misinterpretation or potential misinterpretation with regards to one element of it, which revolved around uh, specifically around the environmental uh, funding stream and what that could and couldn't be used for. So part of the changes that are recommended tonight involve uh, clarifying that position and making it clear, um, as, as indicated, that, that it's not just additional funding, for, uh, or for, uh, for schemes and not just attributable to specific elements of schemes that enhance the, uh, the, the climate change agenda, but uh, any scheme that, that can demonstrate that it a, fits the strategic seal funding requirements and is uh, specifically in its, in its entirety sort of geared towards reducing, uh, uh, helping us achieve our climate change uh, agenda and reducing climate emissions. Uh, that, what that does do is it enables um, the work of the Climate Change Steering Group to progress some of uh, and put some of the, its, its projects forward that meet the strategic funding requirement uh, as set out in the SIL regulations. The other change that's being recommended is, uh, and this, these are obviously recommendations to Council because they're, recomm they're changes to, to corporate policy, is that rather than going through quite an art, uh, laborious process of coming to cabinet and full council every time funding decisions to be made uh, that to try and streamline that process that the uh, the, the SIL allocations panel uh, review the proposed proposed schemes and they make recommendations uh, for which scheme should be uh, uh, given funding and the delegated authority be given to the chief executive to implement those recommendations the two key areas that of the um, uh, protocol that have been amended have been, have been highlighted as part of this, and that's the section of the Climate Emergency Bonus Fund, and the protocol change, uh, sorry, the, the, the funding change at item 32. What members will notice is that for the first round of funding as allocated, as uh, indicated in, in the, the, uh, the, the table with the months, there's no change, because actually the next council to consider these recommendations will be May, which would be the same time as which the first funding recommendations would go up. So uh, assuming that we have, uh, we are able to, to uh, impanel a, a strategic allocations, still allocations panel, a recommendation could still come to cabinet and go to full count, the next full council, um, at which point these recommendations would then be implemented. So there's sort of, we'll do the first round under the existing requirement if we can, and then following Council's approval uh, to the recommendation, should it do so, um, we would then implement the next, uh, the new uh, approvals process for the second round of funding 
and any subsequent rounds after that. I have to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Ben. Are there any questions from members? Oh, this is not, well, maybe it's connected. Do you remember we all submitted what we thought were infrastructure needs in our particular patches, and you're asking the Town and Parish Councils and statutory services. What, what's happened to that list now? Where is, what's the state of that list? Uh, so that, those, uh, those projects have all been reviewed by the planning policy team who uh, manage the SIL allocations process, and they will, they're basically compiling a list of all of those, a, a long list of all of those, and a shorter list of, of those which meet, uh, we can, you know, we can see definitely meet the requirements. This is a, a broad spectrum of projects that have come forward. Some are eminently deliverable, some are not. And they've tried to sort of prioritise those based on, you know, where we know what the funding requirement's going to be, the priority in terms of the, you know, the strategic impact of those requirements. And, um, and, and, and that will then be all be presented to the cell allocations panel for their determination and decision. So I'm not quite sure when the, next, when the first meeting's due to happen, but I'm, I'm, I'm under the understanding it's, it's, it's due relatively soon to try and make that May deadline for Cabinet approval ready for the Council approval in May. Uh, Councillor Cortell. Uh, may I inquire who the planning policy team consists of? Uh, the planning policy team is, is officers, so it's, ma it's managed by uh, Jeff Powell, uh, sorry, Jeff Pyra, um, uh, and he's assisted by uh, Aaron, whose surname escapes me, he's new, and, sorry, Aaron Sams, thank you, yes, that's right, sorry, Aaron Sams, and Ben Yates are the key team with regards to SIL allocations and the planning policy team. Thank you. Are there any other questions of, at this moment in time, before I invite uh, Jonathan to make some comments, please, Jonathan. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, well, I'm a little confused, actually. Um, I'll start with the areas that I'm not confused about. I think it's really important to explain, firstly, that this this process is very different to the previous process. Uh, point six suggests it's the same. It's not. It's different. Firstly, effectively, any infrastructure project that is that is uh, that meets the tests will be on the list. So. If we had enough money to fund all of them, we would. The purpose of the uh, committee and the, the officers will be to um, prioritise them, uh, and that's as I think Ben described, based on you know their deliverability and their and their and whether they are a priority. And the previous system was one where a group of officers effectively locked themselves in an office, made a decision. Didn't tell anyone what, the, anyone what the decision was until contracts were signed. Uh, this is different. The officers will be supporting members, which are made up of, uh, which is set out in the previous report, including the chairman for scrutiny. Uh, they will you know, effectively review the officers' prioritisation and decide, you know, which one if they agree or want to rejig that around. Uh, that list will be uh, will be made public. And, uh, and then the chief executive will uh, implement those decisions. So it is a far more transparent system and one which uh, encompasses the, the base principle of um, funding infrastructure where development occurs and also meeting the carbon neutrality objective. So uh, that is very, very important to understand. Uh, the, the first recommendation, which is about um, the that carbon fund, as Ben has explained eminently well, basically it is a standalone fund. It can be used as a top up, but it is a standalone fund. And that was just not clear in the first report. Uh, what, what I'm a little confused about, which is different to what I understood uh, and what we'd agreed was, uh, when I say what we'd agreed, not what we'd agreed, but what had been proposed actually by, by the officers was that the change would be uh, in terms of that decision process made now. But what I see at point 32 is something different. It, it, it's going through what is the existing process the first time round and then changing the second time. And that was, not, um, that was not what was understood and, in fact, not what is wanted. Uh, so uh, I am, perhaps Ben would like to explain again 
that the understanding of this report, which is why I highlighted over the weekend the concern about this uh, to the officers, is that this process, which is the officers will present the, uh, the, you know, the, the marked up projects to the steering group, which would then be uh, either approved or not and then passed to the chief executive, um, that doesn't, that, that doesn't, that's not what this report is saying. Can, can we have some clarity on that, please, Ben? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So, as 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 I, I sort of started out with, the, the the revised process was recently approved. So, the, the the current process this is this is an amendment effectively to what is the current process, although it was only approved, I think, in February um, at, at February for council, which is that. So, as, as far as it stands at the moment, the approval process is a cabinet report and a council uh, approval at full council. So, what this this one does is it, is it maintains that as the approach until the full council in May, at which point this recommendation will be considered. So it's it's not. Oh, I, see, I, under, I understand. We can't change. This has to go to full council for approval. Yes. So this this as, it's, okay. as it affects policy, this has to go to full council for approval, and there cannot, therefore it's not a decision to be made by cabinet. So okay. No, sorry. That uh, that was that just wasn't that wasn't very clear. So that's fine. So that will, that change will happen after the the May cabinet meeting, uh, the May full council meeting. Yeah. Yeah. But it's obviously hoped that we would be able to achieve a funding round before that to make sure that we can sort of at least a consideration of funding opportunities before that, uh, which may then want to come to cabinet and council before prior to that, as per the original timetable. That may not right. be that may not be possible. All right. No, that's very clear. Thank you for that. I just it, it didn't I didn't haven't quite uh, worked that one through. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to add to this as uh, part of the recommendation was that we should uh, in, ha have in here a provision uh, for, um, if you like, ad hoc meetings where there is a strategic need. So where pro a project or projects may come forward, which really um, the council doesn't want to wait for the, the, the cycle, if you like, uh, it, um, and clearly we can't identify those now, but I think we need the flexibility to allow that to happen. Are you happy to uh, to include that as part of the recommendation? I mean, you talked a minute ago about having a round. I think, which, I think that's which, which would be out, which would be outside this this current process. Yeah, I was going to say I think I think that's a question for members because that's adding in a, an additional process that's not part of this process. So it's, it, it would be down to members to determine whether or not you were happy for that to be included as part of your recommendation to council. Well, I, I'm not sure if I can I can be the proposer being remote, but if, I might ask one of my colleagues, if, uh, if uh, who is in the room, to to uh, to make that proposal that that uh, that the um, process makes a provision for uh, ad hoc meetings if required to to uh, to deal with uh, strategic projects. See, that's yeah. a project. Thank you. I'm happy to move that um, on your behalf because I think. One of the aims of this, and it, it, for some reason, I don't know why, I, my brain doesn't hear what people are saying properly, because it doesn't seem very straightforward and clear to me. And it's paragraph 10 that bothered me, because it seemed to be saying that the paragraphs highlighted were the ones we are being asked to approve of to go to full council. And yet the paragraphs highlighted are the old scheme, not the new scheme. And so I'm happy to I'm happy to support what Councillor Vinehall is saying. Happy to support the principle, which is we know, and one of the things we discovered is that councils cannot move quickly. They are not swift on their feet because of all sorts of rules and regulations, which are quite right to have them because they're safeguarding public money. And so we want systems where we can actually do things and we've got this system in other ways in other um, ways we operate so as long as the system is clear is that we don't have to wait a year to approve a still application uh, i think i think the, it, it, the sort of report read a little bit like the yellow bits were what we were approving as opposed to what we were changing <laughs> sorry Sorry, Chair, if I, if I may respond. That, that, is, that is the case. The, the yellow bits do rec represent the change. If you look at the, 
If you look at the subsequent funding round, um, and particularly the, the month of October, it's very clear that it goes to the Strategic Seal Allocations Panel, and then it's down to the Chief Executive to represent, uh, implement the recommendations rather than going through a formal Cabinet and Council approval. Well, that's, that, I'm, not, that's not, I'm not getting that, Ben. I'm afraid I have to say, if, if paragraph 32 is what is going to full Council, then it's not reflecting the change in the recommendation. If, if, the yellow, if what is written in yellow on this page is what is going to full council, you're basically asking full council to approve the existing system. No, and then, it's, and then uh, somehow later on to change, which is not, it, that doesn't, it doesn't read to me. It, the existing system is already approved as approved at full council in February, following the previous reports that came through on the cell allocations governance policy. And protocol. This represents a change in that from May onwards, which is when the next full council sits, uh, we would no longer have to go through a council and cabinet recommendation process, but uh, sorry, a cabinet and council recommendation process. But the uh, the that uh, that from po that point onwards, it would be delegated to the chief executive to implement the decisions of the SIL funding, the SIL allocations panel, and at that point. If you looked further down the table of dates in October, um, in, in that, it, it tries to make it clear that the strategic cell allocations panel meets, and then the following point on that is that the chief executive implements those recommendations from the cell allocations policy. So you no longer have that process of cabinet and council to go through. Okay. But so that, can't, that can't happen until council approves that recommendation or not in May, which is the next sitting. Okay, so to be clear, you have left the, the process as it is up till uh, May, or actually June, uh, in fact. That's, that, that June one is a typo, I'll admit that, in, in that it should, it, the council sits in May to consider that next. It should say May. And You've left it like that to allow a, a, um, a meeting of the steering group before that time, if that should happen because the, the, the whole process can't change until May, yeah. and then after that time it would change. Is that, is that how I'm understanding that? That's, that's, how, it's, that's how it's trying All to right. So you just need to modify the word June to May, yeah. and, uh, and then we're fine. Um, okay. All right. That's fine. Well, with that, if, if uh, Council Project is happy to, to uh, move that other amendment, then, uh, then that's now fully explained, and I thank you very much. Okay, if I, if I can just invite um, Malcolm to make a comment, and then Councillor Dixon, and then Councillor Bayliss. Yeah, Malcolm? Um, would it help, Chairman? And I, I, I take the point that, that, um, that um, Jonathan, uh, Councillor Vinehall is making, and also take Ben's point. Perhaps what more accurately the table what paragraph 32 should read is, and, and the wording is, is, I'm making this up on the hoof, so forgive me, is that it's the, the January to May reflects the current position. Post-May, we're proposing a new, a new position, and actually the months may or may not apply in that case because the only key bit is after that is that there is the annual... Um, IFS to be published on the Council's website by the end of December. That gives us the opportunity to introduce a little bit of clarity that it's not a continuing process. It's a process that ends in May with a new process beginning from June. Um, I'm not sure if that helps, but I think it might overcome this bit where it does look like that could be read to say that will run from December to December every single year. And it won't run from December to December every single year. The intention was to have a new process from June of this year. Oh, Somebody you. got all that? Because I'm not sure I have. Um, That's why I said it may not be. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, did you? And then I've got Catherine. Can I, can I assist Councillor Prochak and, um, and maybe tidy up her recommendation? Because I think it's a little loose. Can we, can we have the recommendation that ad hoc meetings of the SIL allocations panel can, be, um, can happen with the authorisation of the chief executive and the chairman of the SIL allocations panel? 
Otherwise, we won't have any procedure in how these ad hoc meetings can be agreed. Not if you agree, Jonathan. Yeah, I agree. I think Malcolm's nodded, so I think he agrees. Um, are there any other points that need to be made, Christine? Yes, thank you. I was just going to say that I would have seconded uh, the proposal to have uh, an ad, ad hoc process. Um, and then we've, you know, there may be the need to um, consider match funding. Um, a whole range of uh, issues may come up, um, which requires uh, a bit more fleet of foot. Um, so I'm very happy to second or to endorse um, Councillor Dixon's am amended amendment. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Catherine. Thank you very much. Yes, I started off being very clear about this, and then I wasn't, and then I was, and now I'm really not sure. So I'm quite glad I'm not in the room to have to vote on it. And I do look forward um, to whatever comes forward to the full council meeting in May. Um, but Councillor Dixon's proposal amendment did sound to me to be what I think we were looking for. My main reason for wanting to speak is that I'm just so pleased to have this standalone money for the carbon net zero project. Um, and I think for me, the key with this is that it is spent quickly and easily um, and that the money gets out to the villagers um, both to help ongoing projects and to give a start to projects which many villagers want to begin, um, but really aren't in a position to do by themselves. So whatever we can do to help is great. We've got a community, um, a climate change steering group meeting on Wednesday when we're talking about projects, having this information from, information from Cabinet today, um, I think will really help us move forward with this. So thank you for the fund, and I look forward to the clarity and how we're going to be spending it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we're all very keen to see funding create an impact. I think there's a lot of things that are going on that we're still can certainly um, uh, help underpin and making there some real progress. Um, if I can invite Councillor Thank you, Chair. It was just to um, a procedural point, really, because Councillor Weinhorn has suggested a version. Councillor Dixon has tried his best to explain it to Councillor Project. Why don't they leave this amendment until full council when they've had time to work on the wording properly? That's all. I don't see the need to amend it tonight. You can amend it at full council. Sue? I think it's pretty straightforward from what Councillor Dixon said, and the additional one is to have ad hoc meetings, ability to have ad hoc meetings. So I think what you said, as long as um, Clark has got it down and people know what they're voting on. Councillor Cortell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, fully support the concept of having ad hoc meetings. Um, I didn't fully understand, though, was Councillor Dixon suggesting that both the chair and the chief executive need to um, be in agreement to have an ad hoc meeting? Yes, Chairman, I was. Um, I wondered whether it might be more appropriate procedurally for the uh, chair in consultation with the chief executive to have an ad hoc meeting, because otherwise it means the chief executive, in essence, had a, has a veto on it. I think you'll find that the chief executive has got a veto on most things. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know. Well, yeah. oh, I know. Um, Jonathan, your hand is up. Does that mean it's sort of... Uh, no, it is a... It is a um... Uh, a historic hand, but actually, I, I would I would agree with Paul's point. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a proposal to move this. Someone, uh, Sue, I believe, and, and second, and all those in favour. That's unanimous. And that's the amended. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people will be, be scrutinising the um, draft minutes when um, uh, 
always post them out at midnight tonight. Um, anyway, I think that that officially closes the uh, meeting at um, 10 past 8, Malcolm. Yes, thank you very much.